program is in the form a x less than or equal to b and x is greater than or equal to 0. So, it is not in equational form right and the dual is also not in equational form. So, how do we dualize something that is in equational form? So, let us just uh, do a simple exercise here and so, uh, suppose let us just it is a toy example just to uh, understand what is happening. So, let us dualize this program which is maximize it is not say x 2 plus x 3 subject to x 1 plus x 2 plus x 3 equal to 1. So, I am just putting one constraint to keep it really simple, but this is enough to see what will happen. So, what do you think we should do? Yeah, so, we will write it as two inequalities. So, this can be written as x 1 plus x 2 plus x 3 less than or equal to 1 and minus x 1 minus x 2 minus x 3 less than or equal to minus 1. Now, this is in the uh, let us also put x 1 greater than or equal to 0 x 2 greater than 0. So, now this is in the form of uh, the program p that we were talking about earlier right it is exactly in this form of p. So, so we have something is less than or equal to something and the variables are greater than or equal to 0, but now we have two things. So, let us dualize this and see what happens hmm? minus 1 something somebody said minus 1 yeah ok. So, so let us dualize this. So, what is the dual of this? There are two variables y 1 and y 2. Uh, 0 because this is 0 into x 1 plus 1 into x 2. So, greater than or equal to 0 y 2 minus y 1 greater than or equal to no sorry y y 1 minus y 2 again sorry yeah ok let us write the objective first what is the objective? y y 1 minus y 2 because these coefficients are plus 1 and minus 1 y 1 minus y 2 subject to y 1 minus y 2 is greater than or equal to 0. The second is also I think y 1 minus y 2, but now it is greater than or equal to 1 and the third is uh, y 1 minus y 2 greater than or equal to uh, 1 yeah, because the last two coordinates here are 1 and we also have y 1 greater than or equal to 0, y 2 greater than or equal to 0. So, th that just means that if we take y is equal to y 1 minus y 2, then uh, we are saying that minimize y subject to y greater than or equal to 0, y greater than or equal to 1, y greater than or equal to 1 and y is not assumed to be non-negative, y is a real variable. So, what we see here is that when we start with an equality, the corresponding dual variable so, when you have an inequality the corresponding dual variable is greater than or equal to 0. If you have an inequality less than or equal to 0, the corresponding dual variable is greater than or equal to 0. When we have equality it just becomes that the corresponding dual variable is a real variable. Okay, so, in this way we can generalize any uh, very general uh, uh, linear programming problem. So, in general suppose we have a program P is given by has variables x 1, x 2 up to x n. Now, some of these variables may be said to be non-negative, some of them can be asked to be non-positive and some can be unrestricted, okay, just real numbers. And um, 
so maybe so three types will be there may be greater than or equal to 0 less than or equal to 0 or unrestricted okay and uh, constraints of the form c1 c2 cm where ci is the constraint uh, a i 1 x 1 plus a i n x n and now we will have one of three possibilities either less than or equal to greater than or equal to or equal to and then we have some uh, right hand side which is b i. So, it each each constraint can either be less than or equal to or greater than or equal to or equal to. So, in equational form they would all be equal to right. So, then what we get is uh, and and let us say to maximize C transpose x to be maximized or minimized. So, that also is something which we can. Okay, so, many of these things you can adjust by just changing the sign of the. So, for example, if it is greater than or equal to you can make it less than or equal to by changing the signs of both sides. So, but anyway just for uh, you know to show you how it works we will write the most general thing. So, then d is going to be the following d will have variables y 1 up to y m right and uh, y i will be greater than or equal to 0 or y i will be less than or equal to 0 or y i will belong to r if you have less than or equal to greater than or equal to or equal to in c i. So, you look at this relation c i if that has a less than or equal to then y i will be greater than or equal to 0 this is the usual case that we saw if we have greater than or equal to then you put y i less than or equal to and if we have equal to you just put y i in r. And then the relations here will be q j is going to be a 1 j y 1 plus a 2 j y 2 plus a m j y m. And now we will have uh, greater than or equal to less than or equal to or equal to uh, and then on this side what do we have the constant c j from this c vector and this will be hi I just started this general uh, uh, duality if and then the condition on the variables will de 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 determine what the inequalities here are. So, if x j the condition on x j is that it is greater than or equal to 0 the condition x j is less than or equal to 0 oh sorry uh, yeah that is right and uh, x j belongs to r. So, that is it. So, you can take any general <coughs> Uh, program which involves some variables non negative, some variables non positive and some variables completely unrestricted and you can have these uh, constraints which are either less than or equal to greater than or equal to or equal to and you can dualize it. So, the, the coefficient matrix always gets transposed, but the conditions on the dual variables depend on the inequalities in the constraints and the restrictions on the dual variables depend on the no no sorry uh, the the con yeah the, the the conditions on the dual variables depend on the inequalities uh, depend on the inequalities in the constraints and the inequalities in the dual constraints depend on the conditions on the variables in the primal thing so so that's how you do it in general and you can you know 
it is as I showed you in the previous example, uh, where you have equality, you can actually derive it like that. So, you know if you just sit down and work it all out, how to convert uh, something which is in a general form into in equational form, you will see that all this works fine. Okay, so, so this is how you do a general thing. So, one of the annoying things about this duality is if you start with a program in equational form, where all the variables are non-negative then the dual will not be in that form because there all the variables will be unrestricted. So, it is it's slightly, uh, so even though we like to for the simplex method we like to work in equational form, the, um, the simplex uh, the duality does not preserve that form. So, anyway, but you know again you can make it uh, equational form by introducing new variables and so on, but that is a slightly annoying. Uh, Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry, and uh, now we have uh, b transpose y to b, and that will be interchanged. If that old one was min, this will become max, and if the old one was max, this will become min. Okay, and so in this very general setting, also you have this uh, uh, duality theorem. So, let me uh, give a proof of this duality. The nice thing about this proof is it actually just uses uh, the simplex method. So, uh, so we have this, uh, let us just copy down this program here. So, this is our primal program. Okay, whatever. And so, uh, so what we have to do now to apply the simplex method, we need to add slack variables. So, add slack variables. And so, here all of them are inequality. So, for each equation we have to add uh, each inequality we have to add one slack variable. So, we will be adding slack variables x m plus 1 not m plus 1 n plus 1 up to n plus m n plus 1 x n plus 2. Okay, so, I will use uh, this uh, x bar to denote this full thing x 1 up to x n up to x n plus m. So, this x bar is the bigger vector with the original variables and the slack variables and uh, what happens to this program? We will say a bar is the block matrix a uh, m by m identity matrix right and so, uh, we we are adding these slack variables. We are adding the first slack variable to the first equation, the second slack variable to the second equation, and so on. So it just ends up being like this. And uh, b remains the same. So so in this equational form, and we will also define something called c bar, which is c one up to c n. Maybe it's transpose, and then zero zero zero. The remaining m coordinates are zeros. So, now we have the equational form a bar x bar is equal to b. Okay. And now, suppose we have this thing and so we run the simplex method and we get the final tableau. So, apply the simplex method and obtain, I am being a little uh, this thing about you know the fact that the simplex method can be used to solve every uh, every linear programming problem is something I haven't explained in detail, but 
even if the algorithm is very slow, if you can apply the simplex method and solve it, that is all we need that at the end you will get a nice tableau. So, what do I mean by final tableau? At the end, the yeah, when it is maximized. So, uh, you get a, a optimal basic uh, feasible solution. So, that is something like anyway every tableau is uh, of this form x b, but now this b is a subset of uh, 1 to m plus n right of size m and you will get x bar b. So, these are the basic variables in terms of p plus q x bar b bar. So, these are the non basic variables from now the extended set of variables right and then the objective function is given by z equals z 0 uh, plus r bar transpose x b bar. So, this r bar is less than or equal to 0 that is the that is the meaning of final tableau right and this gives an optimal solution x star b is equal to p uh, is equal to this vector p and x star non basic is what? 0 right. So, the non basic variables are set to 0 and so you get x star b is just p. So, this is the this is the optimal solution. Now, we know how to write all these things in terms of uh, the original data a and so on right. So, let us just uh, recall that yeah. So, it is a vector when I say a vector is less than or equal to 0 I just mean all the components are less than or equal to 0. So, this is correct this is saying that r i less than or equal to 0 for i equals 1 to m. So, these are the coefficients of the non basic variables when the objective function is written as constant plus some linear thing in the non basic variables. Okay, so, that is that is the situation we have and uh, we had tried to calculate what this general simplex looks like. Here this thing right. So, let us just copy this thing. So, I think uh, some. So, this is this is what we have right. So, we can uh, figure out of course, here there should be some bars and so on because I have added bars here, but uh, that is the basic idea. So, let us just uh, look at uh, this uh, uh, value of the objective function at uh, this x star. So, um, so C transpose, so this is C bar transpose x bar star, but this uh, objective function did not involve any of the auxiliary variables x m plus x n plus 1 to x n plus 1. So, this is the same as C transpose um, Okay, never mind, but maybe that is not important. So, this is the same as C transpose x star. So, this is the uh, solution to the original problem and so this is the same as C transpose x star bar because x star uh, the C transpose did not involve any of the auxiliary variables and this I can write as. So, what is this uh, x star bar right. So, this x star bar has uh, two components it has the basic part and the non basic part. 
So, this is C transpose basic part times x x uh, let us see if we have a formula for this C transpose ok. Yeah, we have a formula for uh, x b bar using this. So, we will we'll see that. Okay. So, C transpose uh, b and this will only involve x bar b, because the x bar non basic they are all 0. So, we only have to take C transpose b x bar b. Okay. Now, what is this x bar b uh, or maybe x bar star b? So, this is actually just uh, right C transpose uh, b and we have to write this in terms of. Uh, so, this is just uh, you know um, let us see what it is. So, we have to write it in terms of it is just going to be p because the non basic variables are 0 and p is a b bar inverse b. So, so this is a b bar inverse b. Okay, you are probably wondering what I am doing and in the next step it will come completely clear. So, this I will transpose this whole thing and this will become b transpose and then we have uh, a b bar inverse c b a b bar inverse transpose I guess c b bar. So, this c transpose x star has become b transpose times something. Now, remember we are looking for uh, optimal solution for the dual equation and the the objective function in the dual thing is b bar trans is given by b transpose. So, this should actually be uh, y star it should be the optimal solution for the dual. Okay, so, so if this were y star then we would be done right. We already know that this if this were feasible it would guard the it would be an upper bound for uh, uh, the feasible values of the or original program. But if we show that this is feasible, then we have shown that you know both programs have the a common solution. So, we only need to show that y star equal to uh, a bar b inverse transpose times C b is feasible for D for the dual program, but what is the dual program? So, um, so that means that A transpose y is greater than or equal to 0 and also y no is not greater than or equal to 0 greater than or equal to the dual program what is the dual program hmm? c the, uh, the the objective vector and y bar has to be greater than or equal to 0 that is also there but you can combine these two as saying that a transpose and identity times c is uh, greater than or equal to no a transpose this times y is greater than or equal to 0, because this will be saying the first part will be saying a transpose y is greater than or equal to 0 and the second part will just say y is greater than or equal to 0, ok just block matrix manipulation. So, so this this is what we have to show right. 
oh sorry c c sorry here it should be c and 0. So, c bar c bar is c and 0 c bar is c and 0 right which is the original c at 0. Okay. So, how do we do this? Uh, so, let us just look at this, uh, let us look at the transpose of this. So, y star transpose. So, this is just a bar right this thing here. So, I can just replace this by a bar. This is what we have to show. So, let us transpose this firstly y. So, let us call this y star here. Yeah. y star transpose a bar. Okay, so, what is this uh, y star by definition? y star transpose is c b bar c b bar transpose a b a bar b inverse right and then we have here uh, a bar, but a bar is sort of a b bar and uh, a b bar bar the part corresponding to the uh, basic vectors and the part corresponding to the non basic vectors. So, we will always rearrange the variables where the basic come first and the non basic come second, then we can do this kind of partition. Okay. So, I am using a sort of shorthand, so you have to kind of try to understand what is going on. But now, if we multiply this out, we get C transpose B and here we get A B inverse A B. So, uh, we get identity and here we get A B bar inverse A B bar bar. But this, uh, if you look at these formulas that we had here, A B inverse A B bar uh, C transpose is C transpose uh, minus R transpose. So, so this just becomes, so this first part is just C bar transpose B and the second part is C bar transpose B bar minus r bar transpose, but this r bar is less than or equal to 0 entry wise. So, this is greater than or equal to c bar, because this part is just exactly the b part of c bar and this is less than or equal to b bar part of c bar. Okay, maybe you should sit down and redo this quietly, uh, but it is just reading off from the final tableau, you can show that uh, if you just work this out, you will get a guess for what the optimal solution for y uh, for the dual should be and then you can just show uh, that that is going to be uh, feasible. So, what you have done is you found a feasible base, uh, solution for the dual which takes the same value as the optimal uh, of the primal and so it has to be, uh, but we know that the dual guards the primal. So, it has to be the optimal for the dual and so this proves uh, essentially all the statements in the duality theorem. The other thing is there was two statements which were symmetric to each other. If you look at now my general uh, dualizing uh, formula, uh, uh, you know formulation, how do you compute the dual of a general linear program, you will see that this duality is actually like the dual of the dual is the primal. So, it is a you know. So, this is some sort of um, so, if you if you, so, so, so those two statements in the duality theorem which were symmetric to each other, if you prove one the other follows. So, so this is uh, this is the proof of the duality theorem. Okay, so, what is this duality theorem, why is it so useful and there are several reasons. So, one is that it is also used in uh, more uh, sophisticated algorithms for solving uh, linear programs and the idea of duality will be seen in interior point methods and so on. 
the other thing is it is just a very beautiful mathematical object. Let me illustrate by some manifestation of this duality in graph theory. Okay, so, to do graph theory we are looking at graphs. So, we are looking at problems like you know sub graphs, uh, vertex covers, uh, matchings and so on. In all these problems we will be uh, either choosing an edge or a vertex in a graph. And so, we are not when we choose it we will put 1, when we do not choose it we will put 0. So, we are going to do sort of linear programming, but we only allow integer values for the variable. So, we need to do uh, optimization over integers, but optimization over integers in general is much harder than optimization over real numbers. So, this uh, simplex method uh, may not give you integer solutions, right, because when you are inverting the matrix. Uh, you know in these uh, when you look at this uh, formula that I had these these formulas right they involve some inverse of some matrix and that may actually give you some uh, uh, and if even if the matrix A has integer coefficients its inverse may ha end up having uh, denominators. So, so there is a problem there that uh, even if the constraints are integers the optimal solution may not be integers. And so, if like for in a graph theory problem or something you want an integer solution, you cannot get it by the uh, um, simplex method. Okay. So, your uh, uh, even though your constraints are given by integers the uh, vertices the, the, the basic solutions may not be given by integer points. So, this is a problem and this makes integer programming much harder than um, uh, real linear programming. And so, in fact, uh, these integer programming problems are uh, uh, NP, NP complete I believe. So, you cannot uh, in general solve them, but there is a large class of uh, integer programming problems which are equivalent to the real problems. So, let me just explain those and turns out that some interesting problems do fall into this class and so we can deal with them using linear programming. So, let me just formulate what is integer programming in the first place. So, it will be something like this uh, maximize C transpose x subject to a x let us say in equational form b equals 0 x greater than or equal to 0, where uh, we also require that x belongs to all the co co coordinates of x are integers in fact, non negative integers. So, this is the added restriction. Okay, and uh, so this is a general integer programming problem, and often you can assume that this um, A is an integer matrix and B is an integer vector. Z to the m uh, n m. So, so this is uh, your integer programming matrix. Now, there is one very obvious condition under which uh, the simplex method will actually work. So, the simplex method finds basic solutions and uh, you want to know that those basic solutions are actually integer solutions. So, whenever you invert some uh, sub matrix you want that inverse to have integer coefficients. So, do you know a condition? when the inverse of an integer matrix will have integer coefficients determinant should be uh, plus or minus 1 because then you can just write the cofactors divided by determinant right so so that's the definition that a matrix a m by n matrix could be even a real matrix is said to be uh, str uh, what is the word strongly 
um, totally unimodular. So, usually unimodular matrix just means a matrix whose determinant is uh, plus or minus 1. And so, we are putting a slightly stronger definition totally unimodular if uh, any square sub matrix of A has determinant in uh, the set minus 1, 0, 1. So, saying 0 and 1 for every sub matrix is too stringent because some matrices, sub matrices may be singular. So, you also allow 0 plus 1 or minus 1, but the point is that this A subscript B matrix, it is non singular. So, its determinant will always be plus 1 or minus 1, it cannot be 0. right? So, when you run the simplex method with the original constraint matrix being totally unimodular, then uh, a basic uh, feasible solution will have integer coefficients. So, uh, so, the theorem in this case is that if A is totally unimodular, um, and P has an optimal solution, then P has a basic, then in fact, I should say every basic optimal solution of P Actually, every basic feasible solution of P is um, okay, but anyway, every, every, then maybe I'll just state the most uh, gen crude statement first, and in the, as part of the proof, I'll say the rest. So, so then P has uh, an optimal solution in Z n. And the proof is just that uh, every basic optimal solution, every basic feasible solution in fact, not just optimal to P lies in Z n. And why is that? Well, that is just because uh, this in this, uh, yeah, yeah exactly. So, this uh, this formula in fact here right so this p is actually the basic uh, feasible solution and that is given by ab inverse b and this ab is going to have determinant plus or minus 1 so its inverse will be an integer matrix b we have assumed is an integer matrix so 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 that's it so the simplex method actually tells you that uh, uh, the Mm, the, sol the the optimal solution there will be an integer optimal solution. So, you see this is another example where the simplex method does not just give you an algorithm, but it gives you proofs of theorems. So, so that is one of the reasons uh, I mean another reason to so you know you may say you are a pure mathematician, but then why do I care about these optimization problem let us leave them to engineers and so on, but the simplex method which is an algorithm gives you a proof of a theorem, which is I think uh, quite nice. So, um, yeah. Okay. So, um, so now let us uh, have some fun, I think we spent too much time on just uh, this linear programming and simplex algorithm. So, let us go back to graph theory. So, uh, so anyway, but any questions so far? Uh, so, let us No, no. Uh, so, 1 by 1 square sub matrices. So, that means that A must have entries itself 1, 0 and minus 1. Then 2 by 2 square sub matrices, 3 by 3 square sub matrices and so on. 
Let me give you an example of a totally unimodular matrix. So, uh, suppose we have a graph, uh, let us take a bipartite graph. So, do you know what a bipartite graph is? So, the vertex set is divided into two parts x and y which are disjoint and we have an edge set. So, each edge has uh, each edge is of the form x y where x is in x and y is in y. So, for example, uh, here is an example of a bipartite graph. So, usually when you draw these graphs, you draw one part of the edges uh, on one side or on the top and the other part on the bottom. So, this is my x, this is my y. So, let me give these names a, b, c, d, e and let us call this f, g, h, i and every edge will join something from x to something from y. You cannot have an edge from a vertex in x to another vertex in x. So, that is the meaning of a bipartite graph. So, here is an example of a bipartite graph. I can join b to something in this other part. I can join a also to something in this other part. Okay, but of course, I can join b to many things in the other part. So, for example, I could also join b here. I could join so, this is an example of a uh, bipartite graph. Let us throw in some more edges. Okay. So, uh, a bipartite graph is actually nothing but a matrix whose entries are zeros and 1s. Uh, so, let us number these edges also. I will call this edge 1, I will call this 2, I will call this 3. 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So, I will represent this by its uh, what did I call it uh, incidence matrix. So, the rows will be um, the rows will be the vertices let us say a, b, c, d, e, f, g, h, i and the columns will be the edges 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And as you have seen, each column will have two 1s and remaining zeros. So, in fact, uh, so this first uh, column 1 will be a, a going to G, right, and then the second column will be B going to F. Uh, right, and then the third column will be. Uh, So, is it okay? Uh, 3 is uh, B going to H. And then 4 is C going to H again, right? No, C going to F. Then 5 is uh, C going to H. Six is D going to H. Seven is almost done. D going to I. And then E going to H. Okay, so this matrix here. is the uh, incidence matrix and actually if you have any uh, matrix where uh, so this has this is sort of you know divided into two parts so this above this green line is the x part and below this green line is the y part and this matrix will have each column will have exactly 1 1 in the upper part and 1 1 in the lower part right yeah does it make sense to look at the matrix where the rows are a b c d e and the columns are f g h i and then if they are connected yeah you could do that also so that is actually a more compact 
representation. Especially in the case of bipartite. Yeah, yeah. So bipartite graphs are actually all, in that case you'll get any zero one matrix yeah. will correspond to bipartite graph. Uh, yeah, but let's just stick to this because this matrix ends up being totally unimodular. So claim is that this this is totally unimodular. So that matrix which you said where both the rows and columns are uh, indexed by the vertices is called the adjacency matrix and so that is uh, um, yeah and this is called the incidence matrix. So, they are both uh, different ways of representing uh, um, a graph by a matrix and this yeah this is I guess it is a little bigger but. Uh, but uh, it has the advantage of being uh, totally unimodular. So, claim is that this uh, incidence matrix, um, I do not know what I should call it, IEG is totally unimodular. And how do I prove it? So, uh, we can, so I need to look at L by L sub matrices and show that. Um, every L by L sub matrix has determinant in minus 1 0 1. So, we will do this by induction on L. So, of course, if L is 1 this is clearly true because every entry of the matrix is plus 1 or 0. So, in fact, minus 1 does not even come into the picture right. And suppose we have shown it for L minus 1 by L minus 1 matrices. So, suppose Q is an L by L sub matrix. Now, if Q has all columns with two entries, if every column of Q has, so every column can have at most two ones right because it is the uh, it is the incidence matrix of a graph. So, each edge has only two vertices on it. So, if every column has two ones then one of them will be in the uh, first part and one of them in the second part. So, if you take the sum of the uh, the rows of q which are in x and subtract the sum of the rows of q which are in y that will become 0. So, what I am saying is that Q, so fix a column J and then Q V E. So, okay, maybe Q V J. So, we are taking Jth column, fixing a column. So, that means we are fixing an edge, uh, right. So, so then we take this sum over v in x minus sum over v in y q v j not um, q v j. So, q is the entry of this matrix q v j is this is equal to 1 if v is incident on j and 0 otherwise. Right. If the jth edge has v as one of the vertices, then this is 1, otherwise it is 0. So, if you look at sum over v in x q v j minus sum over v in y q v j, then this is going to be 0 for all j in, in this sub matrix. Does it not depend on the sub matrices? Yeah, yeah. So, but in this sub matrix, every column has two ones. I am assuming that. Okay, so, this is a linear relation between the rows of the matrix. So, determinant q equals 0. So, if every column has two entries then you look at the columns of q which are uh, uh, the ro rows of q which are in x and the rows of u which are in y you subtract them you will get 0. That is uh, the rows add the rows in x subtract the rows in y you will get 0 because one of the ones will come from the x part and the other one will come from the y part for each column. 
Okay. And now what, what else can happen? Well, maybe q has a column which is equal to 0, then it is also determinant to 0. So, that only leaves a case where q has a column which has exactly 1, 1. In that case, you can use induction, you just expand along that column and you will get plus or minus determinant of an L minus 1 by L minus 1 minor. So, if a column of q has 1, 1 use induction by expanding along that column. So, you see the incidence matrix is um, totally unimodular okay. and the nice thing is that uh, some problems can be formulated in terms of the incidence matrix. So, um, two important problems in graph theory are vertex cover and matching. So, so let us see how to formulate those in terms of uh, graph theory. Uh, in terms of linear programming. So, uh, so what is a matching? It is a collection of edges such that each vertex is incident upon at most one edge in that collection. So, a collection E prime of edges such that each V in x union y is incident upon at most one edge in Okay, so, uh, so the empty collection of edges is also a matching, right. So, how you would construct matchings is maybe you would start with no edges, then you would start adding edges and trying to get the biggest matching that you can, right. So, that is the matching problem and the other is the vertex cover. So, for matching you start small and grow. For vertex cover, it is a collection uh, V prime of x union y such that each edge is uh, has contains at least one vertex in V prime. each edge contains a vertex in V prime, at least one vertex. So, here you would start big just take all the edges and then you can try to see if you can reduce it and keep the covering property. Let us just look at some examples from the graph that I drew here. So, let us try to find uh, matching here. So, maybe I will use some other color here. So, so, okay, so I, I want the vertex A to be, so matching means uh, each vertex is instead upon at most one edge. So, let us try to find a maximal matching. Okay, so, so, we will start by just matching things and then you know matching means each vertex is an incident upon at most one edge. So, let us see, okay, I can add this, but then I cannot add this edge B H because B is already incident upon this edge B F. So, let us leave that out. Uh, what about the fourth edge? Can I add that? No, again because F is there, but I can add the fifth edge. Then the sixth edge I cannot add because little h is there. Uh, the seventh edge I can add again, right? and the eighth edge I cannot. 
So, that is uh, the example of a maximal matching. And uh, let us look for vertex covers. So, uh, H, H is covered, I cannot add. So, you see both all F, G, H, I are covered, A, B, C, D, E, A, B, C, D are covered, E is not covered, but the only H from E goes to H. So, I cannot add it. Okay. Let us try to construct a vertex cover. So, vertex cover, uh, now I let us say A, I mean either A or G has to be in a vertex cover, right, because this edge 1 has to have something, and then from edge 2, one of them either B or F has to be there. So, let us say F, I will add F, uh, then from uh, the edge 3 either B or H should be there. Let us say I add H. Okay, oh, I could add, I would, I have to add one more, let us add I. Okay, so, this is a minimal vertex cover. If I remove any of these vertices, it will no longer be a vertex cover. So, is this a vertex cover? So, you have to check all the 8 edges are they incident upon at least one of these, right. Now, in this case, this maximal matching and minimal vertex cover both have 4. So, the maximal matching has 4 edges and the minimal vertex cover has 4 vertices. And this turns out to be a theorem. So, that is called a Koenig's theorem. Hmm? Why? Why is a minimal vertex curve? That is a very good point, yeah. Yeah, that will also have 4. But uh, see, even x is a minimal vertex covering, right? No, not minimal in size, but minimal is in you cannot remove any point. It is not minimal in size, it is too big, but if you take all these, you cannot remove any of these points. So, it is not so clear like that you know you can just always start with some set and keep removing vertices to get a smallest size uh, vertex cover. You have to be lucky or you have to use linear programming. So, so, so this uh, yeah so the greedy algorithm will not always work. So, so, so one you know one way to look for a vertex cover I would start with all the vertices and then I will remove them. So, maybe first I will remove F G H I and it is still a vertex cover, but once I have removed F G H I A B C D E is a vertex cover, but if I remove any of them, then it will not be a vertex cover, because that vertex will not be covered by any that uh, edge, the edge coming out from there will not be covered by any vertex. So, so greedy algorithms like just where you just start somewhere and keep removing will not give you the smallest size vertex cover. So, maybe I should say maximal sized matching and minimal sized vertex cover are the same. So, so the number of edges, the maximal number of edges in a matching. So, let us let us be careful here. The is equal to the minimum number of vertices in a vertex cover. And how do you think this is proved, at least for us? 
No. What were we studying before this? Duality. We will prove this using duality. We will show that the first problem is uh, we can set it up as a linear programming problem and the second will be the dual problem. Right? One is maximize something, the other is minimize something. So, now that I have given you this hint, you can probably even tell me how to do the proof. So, how would we uh, set this linear program up? So, what should be the, so let us look at for example, the matching problem. So, here we have to decide whether uh, an edge is there or not. Let me copy that incidence matrix again. Um, so, so let us take this. So, this incidence matrix will end up being the coefficient matrix. So, uh, what should, so, so let us look at the, uh, what problem I look at, we let us look at the matching problem. So, what is a, a matching should be a feasible solution. So, what is a matching? A matching is a set of edges. So, let us just give one variable for each edge. So, variables correspond to the edges. Edges are these 1 to 8. So, we have variables. The variables are x 1, x 2 up to x 8 and we have 0 less than or equal to x i of course, and it has to be less than or equal to 1. So, we have a constraint which says x i is less than or equal to 1 and then uh, what else is there? So, in fact, we will require it to be an integer and that is not a problem because this is a uh, totally unimodular matrix. So, when we get a basic feasible optimal solution, it will be an integer solution. So, so what are the constraints? What, so, what is the matching problem? So, the matching, a matching means that each vertex has at most one edge. So, that just means that if you look at this, uh, so if I call this matrix A and its entries are A, V, J, where V is one of these symbols indexing the rows, then what we are saying is that each vertex for each vertex you look at the J's. Right. So, j goes from 1 to 8, a v j. So, if my, I would look at the edges which are in my matching, right, at most one edge for each vertex. So, that means, if I choose those uh, vertices, so this should be less than or equal to 1. And uh, what do you want to maximize? X one plus A V J. Ah, sorry, X J. Thanks. It has to be a linear constraint. Plus X eight is what we want to maximize. We want to put the most edges into our matching. Right, and let us look at the vertex covering problem. So, we have variables y a up to y e, then we have y f up to y i, one variable for each vertex, and if that vertex is in the uh, in the uh, vertex cover, then we will say that it is 1. So, we have 0 less than or equal to 
y v less than or equal to 1 for each v in the vertex set. And then we also have, so what is the constraint? Every vertex, every edge should be have at least one vertex. So, we will now sum over all the vertices v in x union y and we will say that a v j y v is greater than or equal to 1. So, um, yeah, so uh, so if you look at these, uh, um, yeah, and what do you need to do? You need to minimize. y summation y v. And so, uh, if, if you can just see that these are uh, mutually dual linear programming problems, then because this matrix is uh, totally unimodular, you will uh, see that the number, the, the optimal value should be the same. So, is it clear that these are uh, mutually dual? Um, just uh, that these additional, cons this part is fine. So, uh, So, we have uh, one equation for each, uh, we have two equations for each edge, right. So, for each, uh, so I should probably say j, we have two equations for each edge. So, we should have, uh, we should have two sets of variables for each. Uh, edge right, because the equations of the dual are um, the, the variables of the dual correspond to the equations of the primal. So, we have uh, ok, so let us just look at this. Uh, and let us work out what its dual is. So, so the variables, so if this is p, then we have uh, for each j we have two equations. So, we have uh, dual has variables Okay, so this oh no no okay so here the this equation corresponds to a vertex and this equation corresponds to an edge. So the dual has variables uh, y v for v belongs to v and a variable z z one up to z eight right. So we have these variables. And uh, in this case, anyway, all the variables are uh, so 
right and then we have to fix. so maybe i should uh, do a small example to see what's happening here um so let's let's just take a small graph so let's take um yeah let's just take a small graph with maybe just a few edges so so we have edges 1 2 3 4 so only four edges and five vertices a b c d e so let's write down this matching problem so what what do we have we have variables um, x1 x2 x3 x4 and we need to maximize x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4 subject to the equations x 1 less than or equal to 1, x 2 less than or equal to 1, x 3 less than not to 1 x 3 less than or equal to 1, x 4 less than or equal to 1 and for each vertex we have uh, so x 1 plus x 2 less than or equal to 1 right. Uh, x 3 plus x 4 less than or equal to 1, then x 1 plus x 3 less than or equal to 1, x 2 plus 4 is that is coming from b right yeah. How do I get x 3 plus no no x 2 plus x 4 is not a constraint. Uh, so, uh, this is this is corresponds to the vertex let me write down the vertex also this corresponds to the vertex A, this corresponds to the vertex B, this corresponds to the vertex C, the vertex D is just x yeah but let us just write it x uh, 4 less than or equal to 1 yeah and x 5 less than or equal to 1. Now, the point is that each vertex for the uh, x 2 yeah, sorry there is no x 5. So, so now the point is that these inequalities actually follow from these inequalities right because if x 1 plus x 2 is less than or equal to 1 and both x 1 and x 2 are greater than or equal to 0 that means x 1 is greater than or equal to 1. Uh, is less than or equal to 1. So, so these inequalities now each uh, each uh, edge will occur in one of the equalities because it has uh, it is incident upon two vertices in fact occur in two of the inequalities right. So, this x 1 occurs in this inequality and this inequality. So, these conditions are actually redundant ok. So, we do not have to worry about so, we can just remove these conditions these are redundant these are redundant, but now when you look at it this is exactly a primal dual pair right. This is A x is less than or equal to B maximize C. So, this is A is what is A? A is this matrix A v j, B is the all ones vector, C is also the all ones vector right and here it is the transpose matrix this is the all ones vector, this is the all ones vector and the inequality has changed in direction and we are requiring that all the variables be non negative. So, this is a p then this is a d yeah it is transposed because now here you are summing over v and here you are summing over j. So, this here it is a transpose. So, so this is a primal dual pair and so just the duality theorem for linear programming implies that uh, implies Koenig's theorem. So, um, 
So, that is uh, of course, you know there may be simpler proofs of Koenig's theorem, but it is nice to see that it, uh, but once you understand duality this is a very simple proof of Koenig's theorem. Uh, duality understanding the simplex method and duality is a lot of work, but once you have it Koenig's theorem comes from this. And just uh, uh, let me give you another consequence of Koenig's theorem which is quite nice which is called Hall's theorem. This is also related to bipartite graphs and uh, uh, so suppose you have a graph G and it is bipartite x union y and a bunch of edges E. And for each subset T of X, uh, let the neighborhood of T. So, this is the set of all things that are connected to T. So, this is the set of things W in Y such that uh, such that uh, V W belongs to E for some V in T. Okay, so, uh, if we take this example here. So, in this example if I take T to consist of say uh, this vertex and this vertex, then what is N T? So, N T will consist of F, H and I. Clear what N T is? Okay. So, now the hypothesis of uh, Hall's theorem is that um, if for every t subset of x the cardinality of n t is greater than or equal to cardinality of t, then uh, g has a matching that covers x. Now, does this graph have a matching that covers x? Right. So, um, just because uh, the cardinality of x is larger than the cardinality of y, it cannot have right. But even uh, if if the cardinality of x and the cardinality of y are equal, say there can be cases where there is no such matching. So, uh, one usual way of um, uh, making this easier to think about is that uh, you have. Uh, uh, so, a sim special case where x and y have the same uh, cardinality it is called Hall's marriage problem. So, you have um, n, n uh, 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 bachelor boys and n bachelor girls and uh, each. Uh, so, for each uh, you have the edge if they are compatible. So, maybe their horoscopes match or something right. So, let us say their horoscopes match and so now so, suppose for each set of boys, uh, each set of k boys, you look at the set of girls whose horoscopes match at least one of those boys, right. Then, uh, if that set that is the neighborhood of the, that set of boys. So, for each set of boys, 
the set of girls whose horoscope matches at least one of those boys is at least as large as that set of boys, then the astrologer or whatever can arrange a marriage between uh, the uh, that set of boys and that set of girls. So, this is Hall's marriage problem with an Indian twist. So, uh, and uh, so, uh, so that is one way of thinking about it and this may not always be possible. Uh, if you have any astrologers in your family, you can ask them this is a very difficult problem overall. So, <laughs> so, so this is uh, a generalization of Hall's marriage pro uh, theorem, uh, where you do not assume that x and y have the same number of uh, elements. So, um, yeah and this is actually uh, uh, follows from um, uh, follows from Koenig's theorem. So, um, so the proof is as follows. So, what we will do is we will work. So, what we are looking for is a matching, but what we will do is we will work with the vertex cover side where it is easier to understand because this condition that we have is is ok. So, you will see let C be a vertex cover. So, that means it is a subset of uh, vertices of G with uh, k vertices in x um, with uh, at least n 1 vertices in. Uh, so, let us say uh, cardinality of x is n 1 cardinality of y is n 2. So, there are um, this this part has n 1 elements this part has n 2 elements. Uh, So, so what do I want actually? I want a matching that covers x. So, I want a matching that has at least n 1 edges right. If I have a matching that has at least n 1 edges it will cover x right. So, I just need to show that there is a matching with at least n 1 edges. So, so I want to show that uh, huh. So, if that is not true then for example, this hypothesis will fail when you take t to be all of x. Right? If you take t to be all of x then n t will be a subset of y it can never be greater than or equal to t. So, so that hypothesis which you are saying is part of this right? you do not need to say it separately this implies that the number of vertices in x is of course, it could be that some vertices are not connected and so on, but for a connected graph it will imply that. So, this will imply that of course, that is that is going to be. So, uh, yeah, so let uh, C be a vertex cover with uh, so, I want to say that every vertex cover has at least n 1 vertices, because then the minimum size of a vertex cover will be n 1. So, what we will say is that every vertex cover has at least n 1 vertices. Then Koenig's theorem will say that every uh, uh, matching will have at most Uh, no, so that that means that the minimum of uh, the vertex cover problem is greater than or equal to n 1. So, then Koenig's theorem will say that there exists a matching with n 1 edges right. So, if there exists a matching with n 1 edges then it has to cover all the vertices of x because each edge goes from x to y. So, ok. So, suppose we have a vertex cover and say it has uh, so, we will argue by contradiction. So, we will say that suppose we have a vertex cover which has fewer than n 1 uh, vertices. 
So, let us say with k vertices in x and fewer than n 1 minus k vertices in y. Okay, so, um, so now let us look at t equals x minus a c that means you look at the vertices in the x part which are not in c and how many elements does this have. So, t has c has how many vertices in x k vertices and totally x has n 1 vertices. So, this is n 1 minus k and so what we see is that n t has at least n 1 minus k vertices by hypothesis right. So, so therefore, now we are assuming that this has fewer than n 1 minus k vertices in y. So, not all the vertices in n t can be in c. So, therefore, there exists a w in n t which is not in c intersect y. So, let us just try to visualize this. So, I have some set. Uh, so, I have some set uh, this is my set T and uh, N T is uh, has uh, yeah. So, maybe this is uh, yeah this is T and N T has at least uh, two elements and we have some element here which is not in the vertex cover. So, this is not in C. And this is also not in C because it is in x minus C. So, then this edge is not going to be covered by the vertex cover, right. So, that means that so the this has a neighbor W has a neighbor by definition of N T v in t the edge e equals v w is not covered by c which is a contradiction huh this is my t the set t this is the set t yeah, just just for illustration, I mean. So we start with C, then we look at the set of elements in X which are not in C, right? We take that to be T. So over here C is T. I haven't drawn C, but yeah, C may be A, C, E, and some other things. So C certainly has A, C, and E, but it may also have some things in the other side. But the point is that the things which are not in C in the x part, at least that many things will be not in uh, that will be connected to that, and that set is now kind of uh, you know uh, is too large. At least one element which is not in C should be there because we are saying that you know there are fewer than n one minus k vertices in Y. C has fewer than n one minus k vertices in Y. But at least n 1 minus k vertices are connected to t. So, that means there is at least one element which is not in c which is connected to t, but t the vertices in t themselves are not in c. So, so both ends of that edge are not going to be in c. So, so this is uh, this is uh, uh, you know Hall's theorem uh, as a uh, um, as a consequence of Koenig's theorem. So, this Hall's theorem this falls into a class of problems called feasibility problems. Uh, when can you solve this kind of logistic problem and so on. Uh, so, as uh, I mean 
uh, horoscope matching can be regarded as a logistic problem, but you can also think of problems in uh, sort of uh, uh, more sort of industrial applications and so on. So, yeah. So that's uh, maybe okay. Maybe I should stop now. So, so this is uh, how you can sometimes use linear programming and duality to understand problems in graph theory.